Well, welcome all to the virtual art exhibit panel. Um, we are very happy for all you to be here. We have an excellent panel of artists that are listed here. And Joe Vitoni will be our humble moderator who will um, be able to uh, navigate us through this panel of talking about art, process, inspiration, and just generally about creativity. Um, I would like everyone to note that we do have a beautiful art exhibit online. Uh, if you have not seen it, uh, it is available. It's just fullbright.org slash 2021-art-exhibit. And I'm gonna put all of these links in the chat to the full art exhibit, which is available online. Um, you can browse art of many artists. Uh, Joe um, was a champion of this project to uh, compile all these Fulbrighters who are also artists and people are um, some of the art is also for sale online so you can actually browse the art and you can buy it if you'd like. Um, I will also be sharing the links to the artists who are uh, on this panel today in the chat as well so if you'd like to look at the art while they're speaking you can do that as well. Um, so be mindful of the chat and you'll see a lot of links for the artists as well as please, if you have questions, please put them in the Q and A um, and we will, the moderator will get to them um, when he can. Also, if you'd like right now, you can put in the chat, uh, maybe where you did your Fulbright, uh, maybe where you're from and what brought you to this session today. Maybe you're an artist as well and um, have some, some, uh, some interest in seeing other people and how they're expressing themselves. Joe, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, and uh, thanks to the whole panel for being here. All right. Thank you, Munir, for that nice introduction, and thanks also for your work in helping put uh, the website together and whatnot and lots of other things. You're a key part of the Fulbright Association. Uh, I had the idea a while ago of putting together this virtual exhibition together a real exhibition I guess it was in 2016 and it showed at George Washington in connection with the uh, National Conference in Washington DC uh, and I thought you know with the 75th anniversary of the program coming up it would be good to celebrate uh, arts visual arts performing arts whatever kind of arts that Fulbright scholars were involved in one thing that interests me a lot is the Mm, how could I say this, like the broad uh, sampling of uh, citizens that the uh, Fulbright program provides us. We have people just from the United States, people I know uh, that are in uh, research institutions, some are in community colleges, some work in non-academic jobs. Uh, there have been people that have received Fulbrights that the Fulbright program always touts every conference. If you go to it, they say, uh, what an amazing world leaders the Fulbright program has produced. At the same time, the Fulbright program has produced a lot of people that are the nuts and bolts of the societies that they come from. You know, they're doing all kinds of things. For me, I uh, am a productive artist, but my day job is teaching. You know, there's no way that I'd make a living unless I wanted to do that. I'm a photographer and uh, I would not want to do that for a living. My personality would not mesh with that. I wouldn't get hired to, I wouldn't get hired by anybody after the first job. Uh, so it, it's great to have that experience. Uh, I'll just mention myself one more time. I did, was a Fulbright scholar in Costa Rica in 2001 at the University of Costa Rica, working in um, teaching and also doing a project in the in the, the Campania in the in the campo in the countryside, uh, kind of based around small family based agriculture. And most recently in 2019, I was a Fulbright specialist in Italy in the area where my family is from in Puglia, the uh, region of Puglia. And so more than enough about me, the maybe see their names, but I'm gonna read them anyways. Adam de Boer, Julie Dicha, Anya Ferian, Aparna Keshavia, Eva Pulizzi, uh, and 
let me ask a question. I've got, this is the long first question. So this is also a memory test uh, for you folks. And if you miss something or add something, that's just fine. Um, I'm gonna go in alphabetical order, starting with dear Adam down here at the bottom of my screen, looking quite smart, by the way. Uh, so let's, let's start by having each of you tell us where you were born, where you grew up, what your, this is, starts with the memory test, where your, what your primary artistic outlet is, where you did your Fulbright grant or grants, and what type of grant program you participated in and its year. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for attending this, this session. Um, my name is Adam DeBoer. I was born and raised in Southern California, but um, as a son of Dutch Indonesian immigrants. So my primary medium, uh, I was trained as a painter in Southern California in Santa Barbara and then went to graduate school in London many years later. Um, and now I use, yeah, this is, the memory test is getting, answering all of Joe's questions. Um, study- Primary artistic outlet, where was your Fulbright grant? What type of, it's a control thing. I, it's obvious oh, gotcha, that I'm in charge because gotcha. I've got all the information right here. Okay. Front of me, but um, I'm going to hold this up. So I studied, my Fulbright grant was in Java, Indonesia, and I studied, or well, I was affiliated as a, an at-large applicant. I was not affiliated with an institution um, and studied indigenous craft techniques. So primarily batik, like wax resist technique, um, wood carving and leather carving um, as a way to integrate those into my painting practice. And in, in the greater sense to integrate those to start making art about mixed race identity. So finally taking on my Indonesian ancestry, Dutch ancestry, as well as the American influences and putting them all together. Um, is that all the answers? All right, okay. that sounds pretty good. And what, I don't know, I missed, did you say what uh, year two, was it? Uh, 2017, 2018, so quite okay. recent. So you're a baby. That's you're new. Well, yes, new to, <laughs> to the Fulbright world. Very good. Okay, uh, let me pass this on to Julie, Julie Dinesha, one of my favorite photographers. I love your work. Uh, everybody, just real quickly, I mean, I picked, it was tough picking five people for this panel, and it's a big panel, and it was hard to limit it down to like three, so I got up to five. Uh, but there are a lot of great people in the show. Uh, I tried to get a spread of media uh, and, and uh, creative outlet because not everybody is a visual artist, but um, okay. So Julie, go ahead. I love your work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Julie Denishe. I was born in Kansas City, Kansas. Um, I, uh, my primary um, form of art is photography. And uh, I was um, part of the slow, or I was in Slovakia um, in 2006 on, under a research grant. Um, and I spent a lot of time um, living in different uh, Roma villages and um, spending time as a documentary photographer, taking pictures of daily life. And, um, and so, yeah, it was like a part of this kind of multi-year project that I've been working on, um, on Roma in Central Europe. Uh, <clears throat> and I think I've was, forgotten a, one of your questions. No, that's okay. Uh, I'm over the power grab. Uh, I'll tell it to you, it's no, no protestation. Uh, you, did you grow up also in Kansas City? Because you work there now, right? I work, You're, yeah, I'm back in Kansas City. I work there now. I spent about um, nine years living in Prague, which was part of what introduced me to um, yeah, Roma communities um, because I worked as a, as a photojournalist and I spent... Okay, very well, good. I mean... Often we were called, yeah, so, sorry. I'll keep it short. <laughs> okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll get back to whatever you want to say. We've got time. Uh, Anya, can yes. you answer some of the questions? Like where, uh, where were you born? Where did you grow up? Your primary artistic outlet? Where did you do your Fulbright grant? What kind of grant was it? What year? Yes, so hi Joe, thanks for having me on the panel. 
Um, I was born in New York, although I was raised in Ohio. My family soon moved to Ohio. And um, my- Where in uh, Ohio? Uh, a suburb of Cleveland called Parma. And uh, very sort of uh, Midwestern <laughs> feel. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Akron. Oh, okay. That's not too far. So I know Parma. Right. <laughs> Go ahead. So my Fulbright was in 1988 to Italy. Um, I went to the town of Pietrasanta. I was at large. Uh, my grant was a, is a scholar grant, but it was also the Mi Miguel Vinciguerra scholarship. I don't know if they still have that. Um, my primary medium, as you can see, is marble. Uh, I don't, although I have done some installations, um, I still continue to carve marble. Um, we, the, the town I went to was Pietrasanta, which is very well known for its um, marble studios. And um, there's plenty of opportunity to, to obtain material and tools. Uh, it was very, very worthwhile, very satisfying to go. All right, great. Uh, Aparna, can you please address those questions? Where were you born? Where'd you grow up? Your primary out artistic outlet? Where'd you do your Fulbright? Yeah, um, I'm Aparna Keshavaya. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. I was born and raised in a suburb outside of Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. My parents um, came to the US from Southern India and I uh, went back to India every, every four years or so. So, you know, very bicultural, fluent in, in both cultures. Artistically, my primary discipline is Bharatanatyam, which is South Indian classical dance. Uh, and I have a dual career in, as a biostatistician in public health research. And I did a Fulbright to India in dance um, at large. And I used, I combined my two careers and did a statistical study of the diversity of practice in classical Indian dance. So I, I visited about 64 schools across the country, surveying teachers and students to understand their attitudes and practices um, in 2006, 2007. All right, thank you much. And Eva, Yes. yes. Hi, everybody. Um, so I was born in Budapest, Hungary, and I grew up in Budapest, Hungary. Um, went to the university in the southern part of the country, in Pécs, um, and I studied English and linguistics. But um, 20 years ago, I moved to the United States, and um, besides teaching um, freshman composition, mostly at different places, I um, realized this dream of um, studying art and um, becoming an artist. Um, my primary medium is uh, fibers, but I mix it with um, ceramics. Um, and my Fulbright was a high school um, teacher exchange Fulbright in um, Corvallis, Oregon. I taught at Crescent Valley High School in 1994-95 English, sophomore and senior English. All right. Uh, okay, let me ask you another question. Some of it's been uh, answered a bit as far as background goes. Uh, you've all mentioned that. Uh, would Adam, would you like to address what led you to your current practice in a bit more depth? You've mentioned, you know, your yes. connection with Indonesia. Yes, I think. Um... So the current practice just comes out of a question that I think a lot of um, immigrants around the world have, like talking about um, ancestry and roots. My father um, assimilated and his siblings and assimilated pretty thoroughly in Southern California and pretty swiftly. So it left my siblings and my cousins, our generation, uh, pretty much in the dark about, you know, this story that was pretty close I mean, pretty close in, in, in terms of chronology. So first as a surfer, I went to Bali um, by accident really um, in 2010 with some friends from college, kind of reunion trip and realized that there was a lot in the culture that felt familiar and a lot that I needed to explore. So 
went back the following year as a kind of surfer artist. I then went back the next time as an artist and then back again um, on a Fulbright grant. So kind of you know, formally a researcher. And um, so where, where did you get this real quick? Where did you get the Fulbright grant? Was it a scholar? Was it a student? Yeah, well, it's student fun, level? yeah it was called, so an at-large student research grant. But at that point okay. I hadn't been in school for like six or maybe eight years, just because I'm not a professor and not affiliated with the school. I was a student, which is pretty fun again. Um, and I felt like a student there. Quite, quite honestly, and still fit and still do. Uh, so I, I was studying traditional textile techniques and then using that um, in a kind of synth like synthesizing that with kind of contemporary painting strategy. A lot of, I, I should say, I also studied in Italy when I was quite young. So like the formal um, approach to picture making um, from like early Renaissance is still really inside of how I conceive of space. So. That plus batik plus images of Southern California is pretty much where, what my artwork Where were like you now. in Italy? Were you in- uh, I lived in a Tuscany? tiny town called, yes, uh, called Cortona. Okay. Yeah, this little, yeah, there's little a lot top there. town. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, ask Julie the same question. Uh, and you mentioned, you know, your academic background. Uh, what, what led you to your current practice? I mean, were you a writer? Did, did, were you first a writer? And you're you're muted, Joy. You need to unmute yourself. Sorry, thank you. Um, right. Yeah, um, I um, I actually started out as a photojournalist, and I spent a lot of um, I spent a lot of time working for newspapers and magazines um, based in Central Europe. I was li I lived in Prague. And um, so most of my I mean, my experience as a documentary photography kind of is built out of the editorial um kind of the editorial school and so mm -hmm. often um we'd end up like covering roma communities and um it was a real they were real quick trips and i always felt like we you know it was un you you didn't really have a chance to like get to see what real daily life was like so right. um um exploring you know different communities and kind of getting a chance to kind of tell the real you know tell a more real story right so was really work embedded more more long form yeah. sort of stuff uh, and did you uh attend school at all for your artistic discipline yeah for the artistic discipline part of it i went to the university of kansas and um right. i studied photography okay all right good deal um Anya, you want to tell us a little bit about what led you? I mean, when did you start doing artwork? What led you to your current practice? And uh, what sort of formal training? Yes. Yeah, so when I was in art school, um, I, you know, took a sculpture course, really liked it, worked in some softer stones like alabaster and soapstone and lucked out one summer when my school offered a summer course in Masa Carrara in sculpting in marble. I thought, hmm, this sounds interesting. Went over there and-, and just Can you, what, what uh, area of Italy is that? It's, um, it's in Tuscany. It's north, uh, northwest of Florence, just north of Pisa. And all right. it's all along, um, the Appuan Alps, which of course are filled with marble. So when I went to this course and, and was shown the, the tools, they use air hammers and um, they have so much marble, you can't believe, it. I was like, wow, this is, this is so much fun. Carving this, this beautiful material, is, it's just out of this world. So sort of that got me started. And since then I was like, wow, how can I get back to marble? Because you, you, know, you need the equipment, you need uh, to work on it. So I mainly worked in uh, the softer stones when I came back to New York and had my studio uh, and couldn't wait till I had the, my Fulbright, which really then propelled me in the direction that I'm still in now, which is working in marble. And, sort and, of, then, uh, and what, what led you to get a Fulbright grant or apply for a Fulbright grant? You well, weren't during, teaching, correct? 
Did you apply? Were you in the, the senior scholar program? The core no, program? No, I no, I wasn't teaching. I was I was actually had a day job and um, was working on my uh, portfolio, my artwork in the evenings. Mm -hmm. And the professors that I had that summer in um, Italy incurred, I said, oh, you know, I'd really like to go back and learn more and study this um, technique and um, get to know the material and, and, and all of that. And they encouraged me to get a Fulbright. So I actually applied, and, applied more than once. I applied one year and they told me secretly probably, she goes, oh, we, we were gonna give it to you, but there's a Fulbrighter still there and we only give Fulbrights every other year to that particular area. So, for that. so what type of grant was it? Was it a core program grant? Did you go over no, it was a scholar? It, or did it was you go a over scholar. as a student? No, it, yeah, it was a student scholar, but okay. at large, because I wasn't, even though I applied, I, I did have right. a, a studio uh, with an Italian craftsman, an artigiani. I okay. did stay with him and right. learned from him, but it was not you know, a student program. No, it was at large. All right, thank you. Uh, Aparna, do you want to add anything? You told us a good amount on the first answer about your background and what led you to your current practice. Uh, I realize that you're a biostatistician, correct? That's right, yeah. What, so did you have formal training in dance or is that just, you know, in your family? And I, I wanted to say too, I like the way you correctly pronounce Minnesota with a D <laughs> and then a T. I can always <laughs> tell when I'm on the phone with any sort of people in a call center. I say, where are you from? The Midwest? And I start guessing, is it Minnesota? <laughs> is it Wisconsin? Or maybe it's Canadian. But go ahead. I digress. I always tell my husband I don't have a Minnesotan accent, but I think maybe I do a little oh, bit. Oh, maybe you do. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, I, um, so, yeah, for... Bharatnatyam, Indian classical dance at the time I was learning wasn't institutionalized in the U.S. So there was no course, right. you know, I could attend. It was really in the homes of people like my parents. You know, my, my teacher came, like my parents came from India. And she taught in her home and I, you know, every time, every Sunday I'd go, we'd dance in the laundry room, you know, wherever there was space. And then the I'd go home room? in the laundry room because that was the only place that had linoleum and this is, there's a lot of slapping of the feet so you can't dance right, on carpet. Right. So that was like the one area without carpet, um, you know, back in the 80s and when everyone loved carpeting. Um, after grad school, so I, I trained for, you know, from the time I was six, seven years old, all the way through and until college. And then I left home for college. Um, and at that point, I started developing my own vision for my dance. So I no longer had a formal guru, but I really started honing what I thought was perfection in my own technique and in my own form. And I started teaching after graduate school. And when I taught, I saw a lot of um, women, you know, young women who like me had kind of, they had learned when they were young, then they gave it up for school, and then they were kind of getting back in touch with the dance form. And there were little differences, like stylistic variations in the form. Right. And I saw this when I had gone to India and trained as well. And I wondered, you know, to what extent are these really kind of part of a unifying tradition, which is what I kept hearing, that there's a singular unified tradition, or is it really just kind of a hodgepodge of different practices? And, and I realized statistics is kind of the perfect tool to study variability. And so that's what kind of led me to, to do this hybrid study. Yes. It's a real interesting story. Well, I want to, <clears throat> when we get done with a couple of these things that I have jotted down, I wanted to take time to show each person's work and show, you know, for sure. Uh, uh, if folks in the audience here haven't seen it, uh, you know, most people have work that you can look at that like hang on a wall or sculpture of some sort in uh, a partner's medium is dance and composing and choreography. So we'll show some video of that also. All right, Ava, you wanna to talk to us about your, I, I, I'm interested too, like as far as your artistic discipline goes, have you had any formal education in that? Tell, tell us a little bit about growing up in the uh, Soviet bloc <laughs> and how warm and welcoming everybody was to artistic output back there well um there wasn't 
that's how I remember at least. There wasn't really a whole lot of art. It was um, huge monuments, you know, um, Soviet leaders or even Hungarian um, leaders um, and historic figures. But at school, we didn't really do a whole lot of art. Um, we didn't go to museums. We didn't discuss art. I don't actually remember at all what we were doing in art classes. Mm -hmm. um, but did uh, you have them? Were, were, did they exist? Did you in have high them school? Classes? Definitely not in not in um, the, the right. school system is a little different, so we don't break it into elementary and then uh, middle. So it's K through um, eighth grade and then high school. Um, in high school, we had an art teacher and. Um, she would lecture. I know, I remember she tried to share modern art with us because she was a painter herself, but I just, I just don't remember anything, to be honest with you, what we did um, in what we discussed, because maybe how she was lecturing about it. We did not have any art classes like my daughters have it now. Um, so it was sitting in a classroom and just listening to someone discussing, you know, uh, modern or abstract art with you. And we didn't have any foundations for it. So it was really very, very foreign. Uh, but I wanted seem, to, you seem to, you seem to be, <clears throat> you know, you're involved in language and study and teaching. It's like, I know people who have studied languages and they can translate the hell out of something, but they can't speak it at all. You know, it's mm -hmm. like they were lectured on it and they read it, but they don't, uh, you know. It's yeah, not, I studied. It, it I studied a lot form. of. I studied a lot of languages, so we all were. We all had to study Russian all the way up to college, um, and I. I did speak it enough. I could communicate, and I. You, I could write the Cyrillic alphabet, um, and in fact, Russian was really hammered into our heads so hard that. Up until a few years ago, um, I could still recite the Soviet hymn because we had to sing it so often. And I remember one morning um, waking up having this dream that, oh, I don't remember it anymore. And I was, I was almost afraid that I would get punished. And I tried to, you know, <laughs> recite it in my head. And then I was so happy that I don't remember it anymore. And I'm still alive. And I'm fine. So... I, I did want to go to a, um, I think it was called um, Applied, School of Applied Arts, because mm -hmm. for some mysterious reason, I was always drawn to fibers. Um, I don't have, uh, I come from a blue collar family. My grandmothers were uh, farmers and maids, so I don't have any, you know, anyone in the family who would have shared or instilled any sort of uh, appreciation for art in me. But I wanted to design textiles and I wanted to weave and um, I couldn't do that. So I studied linguistics and I studied English and then I taught English for uh, for about 30 years um, in Hungary and then for the past 20 years here in the United let's, States. Let's come back to the visual art part here in a second and have uh, Munir, not right this second Munir, but have Munir bring up some examples so you can talk about your beautiful work. Uh, and which I've uh, a lot of this stuff that's on the website I've seen only virtually, but your stuff I had the pleasure of seeing because it was in the uh, 2006 show. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much everybody in this show uh, it had a Fulbright in their particular discipline or in an artistic discipline. There are just a couple people who are grand. Uh, grandpersoned in, grandfathered or grandmothered in. You're not old enough to be a grandmother, but uh, you know who were. I, whom I specifically invited to show because their work had shown physically at George Washington University. Uh, let me ask uh, the uh, uh, couple of questions individually. Mr. DeBoer, let's circle back to you, good sir. Okay, so I've read your stuff and you guys can tell by the questions that I'm asking that I um, you know, have read the material you provided. Uh, but some things pique my curiosity, like how did you get from Santa Barbara being a surfer dude like you were to uh, Chelsea College of Art in London? That's a big jump. Uh, it is a big jump. Um, I lived in 
Washington, D.C. My first job was at the Hirshhorn Museum, working as an art preparator. Uh, so just being in D.C., it was a very international place. Um, I lived in a big row house, and two of the young women that lived in this eight-bedroom house um, had gotten Fulbrights before. So I think it was just kind of on my mind, a more international career could be possible. So um, the Chelsea College of Art is a, a school that's been around for a long time. And in the early 90s, a few of my favorite painters, contemporary painters, went there. So I applied when I was ready to go to graduate school um, just to see if I could go. And I got a scholarship and I went where the money was. So that's really where so, how the decision so was made. And it, it changed everything, really. It just opened me up in terms of a professional, just having access to different um, just different networks and, you know, able to exhibit internationally really quite young. I think I was 27 when I had my first solo show um, in the UK. And that, and then that kind of momentum enabled me to apply to the Fulbright and then just think about, you know, expanding, being a more international, um, an international artist from, from the beginning. So you did your Fulbright. In, in Chelsea. In, That's no, no, did I did it in Java, Indonesia about five years later. Chelsea was okay. just. Yeah, just that's what I got. School. I, I uh, mm -hmm. was confused there. All right. So, yeah, so the yeah, images that we you see. You were completely, mm -hmm. as, as I understood your original description, you were several years after, after university altogether, graduate study and whatnot. That's correct. Yes, okay. I, I, had been, I had been finished with graduate school for about five years before. I applied and I also, um, I tried to, to get a Fulbright to Nicaragua. There were years in my life where I, I kind of thought I was Latino, not in actuality, but more in spirit. And um, after living in Costa Rica as a surfer, went to Nicaragua as a surfer and tried to live there and um, got the kind of secret call as you were describing saying like, hey, you know, better luck next time. There's very limited funding in, these particular countries so might want to do some research about where you'd like to go and see the kind of projects they want to support before you spend all the effort next time so many years later after i had um, already been investing so much time and energy into indonesia as an artist um, i used that artwork to apply so it all it all kind of made sense after a while so, yeah. so, the, so the images that we see here on the screen they're like the top three the first two, those are images of Los can, Angeles. Can we can, can we come back to that a minute? Oh, sure. Because uh, I have like I like to have a section where everybody is we're going through this and uh, gotcha. just circle back to it. Uh, not to interrupt you because I definitely want to hear what you have to say. As I imagine most other people listening want to hear what you have to say. But I had a couple little setup questions here, and then give people a block to talk specifically about their work and to show some of the dance. Uh, Julie. Uh, so in, in, we touched on this just a bit before. Uh, I see you have degrees in journalism and Russian language and literature. Uh, and like I said, I love your beautiful images of uh, the Roma and Slovakia. When did you first pick up the camera seriously? Was it before university? Uh, and, and I'm not clear on your relationship. I know you're job is a uh, you know media specialist uh in kansas city but do you you know could kind of you can dovetail these together you're working with photography you're working in journalism you're obviously studying language do you have you in the past regularly written with your photographs or do you now i mean i worked for a little scripts howard weekly one time where i was doing illustrated features so you got to do everything, whether you wanted to or not. You know, you took the pictures and you wrote the story. You know, what 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 is your story? Uh, yeah, I was well, first picked up a camera probably seriously when I was uh, in high school. And, uh, I worked for um, you know while I was at the Star. I did, or excuse me, while I was at in university, I worked for the Kansas City Star um, as first as an intern and then later as a photographer. And that's sort of how I, I got, you know, that was kind of seemed like a logical way to try to make money from photography. Um, and right. back in the nineties, you know, it was, it was a, 
but I was primarily a photographer. I mean, of course you do little stories sometimes, but, um, but yeah. And then, um, uh, I, I think I, I, you had another question. Well, I'm just wondering how those things went together because you, you mentioned that you studied photography in university, but your degree is in journalism. I mean, was that yeah, journalism with an emphasis in photography. So like, okay. um, so right. like I did a lot of study and reporting and, 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 but photography was my primary focus and, right. um, and yeah. And so like it, I work for NPR, the NPR affiliate in, in, which sounds bizarre, <laughs> um, but I, but we have a website and I do photography, I do sound, I do um, some kind of multimedia reporting. Um, sure. So a little bit of video. Um, right. So I do a little bit of everything. That doesn't sound bizarre to me. That's great. I'm a big <laughs> NPR fan. Damn leftists. Uh, yeah, that's good. Okay, uh, Anya, you may have answered my questions. Let me uh, think quick on my feet here. Uh, you're a sculptor, uh, and while I why I can imagine why, knowing Italy as I do, can you elaborate just a little bit on that and tell us? Uh, what drew you to Italy and describe maybe one near if you have some more uh, pictures of uh, P uh, Pietra Santa, right? It's Pietra Santa, yes. And the name Pietra Santa means holy stone and, and not for not a good reason. It, there's really beautiful marble mountains behind this town. And the, the town was founded Actually, Michelangelo came to this town to uh, go up to the quarries himself to find up, marble, yeah. appropriate marble for what would become his statue of David. Uh, the whole industry of Pietra Santa is marble. So you've got, you've got the studios where the Italian craftsmen, the Artigiani, they make um, um, monuments for, for the cemetery they do copies of famous works like the David, sorry, that's, that's a fire truck outside my window. Um, they do, they have the Pietà, they have Kanawa's work, they have plaster copies and they make, they make these sculptures. So because the studios are, um, so there's so many of them, there's, it attracts international artists. So artists from way back have been coming there, like um, Henry Moore, Noguchi. They come because, because of the material. Um, so when, you, when you're there, you can, you can ask one of the Italian artigianis for space. They have tables. They'll usually rent out space for you. Right. Um, here you see pictures of the quarries because once you go there, you're, you're, you see the mountains right behind the, the village and you've just got to go up there. Every sculptor I know has visited the quarries. You need to go up there on a Sunday though, because, it, or if you have an appointment with the, the company, because if those trucks loaded down with marble uh, are coming down and you're going up on these hairpin turns, you're, you're, you're gonna be like one of the next crosses on the side of the road. You've got to- Driving, go driving your little rented Cinquecento. <laughs> I had a, yeah, I, I lucked out. I was able to buy a car from a, another woman sculptor who was leaving, okay. so I bought it for like, like $200. But okay, listen, a, I got- I, I gotta ask you, okay, did the people in Pietra Santa tell you that Michelangelo came there to pick out that marble? Oh, we, everybody knew that. There was even a-, a, a But it was the people there, it was the people there in Pietra Santa, right? Because, yeah. and yeah. I'm not saying I'm right, but I remember really clearly from my study in Florence, you know, cause I got degrees in fine art, a lot of art history. In Florence, they had this big piece of marble that nobody could, nobody could take on. Oh, uh -huh. you know, we need Michelangelo to come in here. So anyways, they brought him in. And if you look at it, I imagine you've seen it. It's a bit narrow, you know, so it was kind of awkwardly shaped for the job, but it had been there. And again, I'm not saying I'm right and you're wrong, but uh -huh. if the people in Pietra Santa told you that, I think maybe there, but it's very typical Italian to, to brag on stuff. To brag, like yeah, yeah. They had a bar <laughs> Michelangelo with a plaque saying, here stayed Michelangelo and all that. Yes. Oh, okay, yep, all right. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, it's um, the same thing with like with uh, saints and stuff. You know, um, so and so is here. Yeah, you got to wonder how many bones, uh, how many pieces of the true cross there are, and right, how many you have bones the, Saint Nicholas actually had. Right, you could have a lot of relics of the same, but the, it, the fact is that I'm teasing. It, I'm, I'm well, teasing. Think, <laughs> Aparna, can you tell us a little bit? Uh, it, this this like rich collaboration occurring within you as a person, and now you started addressing this already. But one part of you is a creator, uh, a creative, a dancer, choreographer, musician, composer, uh, and the other part is a biostatistician. Uh, so, are you? terribly schizophrenic and do all your friends have a really hard time being around you but they stay around you because you're so brilliant or how do those two things reconcile each other i don't have time for friends no, I'm just kidding. No, I understand. <laughs> no, it's it's a busy life but i i love the balance i mean the research you know really speaks to one side of my brain that's incredibly logical it's a side I have to fight when I'm choreographing because sometimes I, I try and make things too linear, which is right. great for one job, but horrible for the other. Um, what's the, yeah. what's the, what sort of bios, I mean, that's such a huge area. What so, sort of biostatistics do you do? Yeah, I've spanned the gamut. So I don't fit into categories well is why it's always hard to talk about what I do. But I started with uh, research involved in oncology. So study, doing head to head comparisons okay. of treatments for breast cancer. Then I moved to psychiatry, looking at different forms of mental health therapy for different mental disorders. And now I do broad public health research and kind of switch to a health policy focus. So trying to figure out what sorts of programs and policies improve health and public health more broadly. Okay, just like your Fulbright, and, and again, you mentioned it some, but that opportunity to combine the disciplines like that and the number of places you went is uh, pretty amazing. Can you touch on that briefly? Like, not like being the statistician you are. What what major what what are the three cities that you went to? You know, the different schools and how many people did you interview for this? And yeah, I don't so know I, that you've completely established your main thesis of how kind of wild west dances at this point and it doesn't look completely back to the old um, styles. Yeah, so Veritatium has undergone a lot of kind of punctuated transformations over the years and about a hundred years ago in the 1930s um, it was completely revolutionized in a way that people don't know like what we see as this um, proscenium stage dance form with silk costuming musicians seated to the side very neatly in a classical format that was all modern invention. It looked really different. You know, the hereditary form that was passed on from generation to generation had much more of this kind of folksy type of feel to it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a dance form that's changed a lot over the years, but yet in modern times, people talk against um, changing anything. You know, they and, and dancers, young dancers in India that I interviewed were really stifled. They'd say, who am I one person to question 2000 years of right. tradition? So like they're, they're mistakenly clinging to a tradition that doesn't exist. Exactly. You know, specific, I should say a specific tradition that doesn't exist. That's right. There's such rhetoric around it. And so I, I had to measure it, right? I had to say, is this really there in a way that's quantifiable? And so yeah. I, I had a um, sampling frame as a statistician. There was an online directory of dance schools from the site called nartiki.com. And I did a, a stratified random sample and I, um, I selected 64 schools in three different cities in Chennai, which is in Tamil Nadu in the south, which is where this form kind of originated. In neighboring Bangalore is a city in, in the next state over, Karnataka, which is where my family is actually from. Um, another southern city, but you know, one, one step removed. And then in Delhi, which in the north, there's a different classical format called Kathak, which is practice. So the Paratanatyam is kind of a secondary form. And I wanted to see you know, when you look in the, the uh, place of origin versus nearby versus further away in the north where there's more mixing and globalization, mm -hmm. were there differences that registered in, in the survey that I developed? So I interviewed or surveyed 212 teachers and students across 64 schools. Which is, yeah, not half bad for a single person. That's, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I went I to the copier every need, week. <laughs> yeah, I think all of us need at some point uh, permission to do something. I mean, for, for that age group anyway, I mean, for younger people to say it's okay for you to experiment, it's okay, you know, you're still learning the craft. Ava, let me ask you, uh, because part of your background, I, I, like I said, and you know, and I, I love your work, but I keep being fascinated by the fact that you came as a Fulbright scholar to teach English language mm -hmm. to native English speakers. Now, is or was that typical of Fulbright experience? Do you know anybody else who's done that? Was that normal? Like my university brings people in from China or the Middle East, you know, uh, to teach language. I cannot remember hearing of somebody who came over to teach. Uh, and you were te you weren't you were teaching what composition to the students? Yes, yeah, so on my Fulbright, I did regular sophomore and senior English in a high school. Okay. And uh, after I moved here permanently, I um, could draw on that experience, you know, with my degree, I was eligible to teach in um, colleges and that was freshman composition and also English as a second language. Yeah. Yes. So it was it was interesting. And uh, you asked how many, if I know anyone else, um, many of my colleagues from my high school actually did that. So I think because my high school was a, um, I think it would qualify as a prep school. Um, Real, we had, education. Uh, yeah, we had a really good relationship with Fulbright. So um, I was the second one to get this award from my high school, but then I'm thinking three other colleagues of mine got it in. Like, you know, every year we had a Fulbright exchange teacher. In fact, uh, that's how I met my husband because he was a Fulbright teacher coming from the United States to my high school. Um, but I think in Hungary, I, I don't know the situation currently. There was at least a dozen of us, if not more, coming to the United States back then to teach yeah. in high schools. Yes. It's a great exchange. I think it's fantastic because for mm -hmm. teaching things like composition, it has nothing to do with, I, I, like from my experience, people who study a language as a second language or a third language know the language, you know, much, much better than native speakers of the language. You know, it's a lot better. A, a buddy of mine named Karoli in Budapest, and I won't use his last name so he doesn't sue me, but uh, when I heard him speak English, I first met him in Washington, D.C. I was like, my God, man, I can't believe this guy's English is so clean. He sounds like he's from the Midwest someplace. It's like, how can he grow up in Budapest? So I found out later that he's born from Hungarian immigrants. He grew up in Chicago, oh. and, but he learned <laughs> Hungarian at the same time. And then he went back over uh, and he, I mean, he's in charge of the Fulbright program, uh, you know, the Hungarian United States Fulbright program. But I was taken aback. I was really impressed. I'm still impressed by him, but not for how good his accent is. Uh, but, but, you know, Joe, it, it doesn't always pay off to speak let's say textbook English or speak really well, because I remember when I when I moved here 20 years ago, we lived in Brooklyn with my husband. Um, and uh, one day I went to this Italian deli, you know, to get lunch or dinner or something. And I was speaking in my nice textbook, can I please have a half a pound of I don't know what. And the guy was just looking at me uh, like, where, where, where did you come from, lady? What other planet? Like, I don't understand what you're saying. Right, right. And then I, a couple of times, I overheard these short exchanges like, hey, how's it going? What's up? Or I don't even know, you know, like it's totally right. nonsensical to me. Huh? And they understood what they were saying. And I was just like, I just can't speak like that. So it, it really took me. And, and even today, you know, people would ask, how are you? And I was, I would look at them and think about the answer. And um, because it's just still not natural to me, this small talk, like, should I say I'm fine or shall I say, give me a shot of something and then I will tell you how I really right. feel. Yeah. So, You've so been embedded for a while, though. It is interesting. You've got it, you've got it down yeah. pretty well. Yeah. Uh, before we run out of time, uh, why don't we do rounds and have people talk about their work? 
Uh, Monier, are you with us still? I'm always here, Joe. Okay, I figured you were. You're like God <laughs> in some ways, especially with that beard, uh, being uh, an ex altar boy as I am, Italian Catholic. But uh, so, what are we looking at? We've got Max, and I'd like to have some time for people to come. We've been going 50 minutes now. Can we go just bump down the line and have like Adam talk about his work some, bring up his uh, website if you want to fill us in some. Uh, and then Julie, Anya, Aparna, and Ava. Adam, you want to have him click on anything? And we've got five people to sure. go through and try yes, to yeah, at we'll... least 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, so this is uh, the sample of works that I submitted for our show. Uh, the top three are paintings made with a batik process, and which is a wax resist technique I learned in Java. And then the bottom um, four are room screen diptychs. So they're sculptures, but they're also paintings. And then they use wayang, which is a shadow puppet performing arts tradition, um, as a kind of formal basis to create these shadow projections. So you can. When you're, you can click on any that you think are interesting, but um, so that, yeah. So that is like a, a folding screen that can be folded into this shape and then illuminated from within and then fills the gallery with, um, with, the, with so the shapes. How, how, how endemic, how far spread are things like the shadows and the shadow puppets in Indonesia and in Southeast Asia? I can't really speak to, anywhere else in Southeast Asia I've never been but um, Wayang is a Javanese tradition that is that like predates written language it's usually performed in Javanese which I do not speak so they're they're generally Hindu stories Hindu fables um, and that's a very complicated tradition that a lot of tourist artists come and want to riff on Wayang I knew better than that so rather than making the puppets themselves or trying to do something with performance. I just took the formal qualities of the, or the materials and then made something else. The, so, the, the tiger piece here that we're seeing now. Yes. Uh, this is what, like a glass, it's a stylized wagon, a stylized- Well, that is a painting. wagon landscape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the image, so the surface of that is, is water buffalo hide that's been turned into a kind of parchment so that was a whole other study that i did during the fulbright year and then hand cut with all these different shapes um, on top of that is the painting the painting depicts a taxidermy javanese tiger in my father's hometown um, there are a lot of references to family history and also um, a contemporary novel uh, a contemporary novel uh, indonesian novel that that this is the reason there's a lot of things going on in this piece, but then if you click to the right, it shows the installation in a darker gallery. So the idea is that the piece can be can like reveal this colonial history. So those are these tile shapes. The tiles have a very interesting colonial history too in Java. So um, I wanted to make a diptych that you could kind of walk around. The verso of the like on the other side of the tiger is a, a grisaille painting of this of a seascape. So I did, there are not enough images to show the whole sculpture in, in full. Can we look at the view from the studio window? Oh. It's up in the upper left. Or, oh, I'm right. Sorry. Yeah, right. No, that, yeah, I don't think that painting is in this show. So this is a painting of the LA River. It was made a few years ago. Um, that's another one of the LA River. In the but, right one, I said left, but I meant right uh that that's the view from your studio window correct or no i've made a painting of my studio window this okay. is a painting this is kind of an an imagined image of contemporary jakarta um, right. so you see the flooding happening in the village below and then you know in the kind of higher drier ground there and the sky rises there's it's like a, such beautiful beautiful work i go oh thank you so much you're you're a craftsman you don't need me to tell you, I know, but the work is just stunning. I appreciate that. Thank you. Julie, you want to tell us about your work? 
Uh, yeah, I felt like it was really important to um, kind of get a sense of, you know, both urban and rural communities. Um, and uh, um, my first photo there is, um, it's, it's a, a whole series of balconies in Košice, which is one of the larger cities in Slovakia, sort of in the Eastern area. And, um, and it kind of shows the, you know, how compressed people are living sort of in this, in this sort of urban setting. And, and then, you know, I spent a lot of time, you know, going and living in different, with different families. And I'd spend about, about a month living with different families um, in, in different villages, sort of in central and Eastern Slovakia, and just try to disappear into the, into the woodwork and hang out and take pictures as people were, were doing, you know, you know, just kind of living their lives. And, and for the, the show that um, the World Bank picked up, it was, it was all about sort of women's work and the kind of things that, you know, the sort of repetition of, of, of kind of this, you know, simple tasks, you know, everyday tasks that um, are repeated every single day. And um, just kind of trying to find quiet little moments when people were, you know, just being themselves. And uh, yeah, so. Yeah, that was one of the things I liked a lot about your work and why I asked you to join us on this panel because that emphasis on these these people that hold the, the family together that form the fabric of the family, the women that did the work of carrying babies and bringing them into the world and are charged with taking care of them. And that, you know, your, your uh, comment that the, the repetition of it you know, but it's, it's the richness. It's such a richness in life. You know, it's, I, I know people that have had, well, I'm glad I don't have kids because I'd be with them now if they were sick, but that's what it's about. Like what, what is being alive about? You know, it, that's such a great thing and it, you do it well. So where, like when you're embedded like that, where are you staying? Did, did you rent a flat? Did you stay with a family? Uh, how do yeah, the I'd, logistics go? I'd stay well um what I do is I you know talk to the Vida who's you know kind of the mayor of of the Roma villages and find out you know where they it would be okay for me to stay and I'd stay with a family um I felt it was really important to kind of embed myself where yeah. wherever um wherever it was comfortable to have an extra person because you know often quarters were were kind of tight so I'd live with a family while I was working same family or did you move around a bit? Um, I would stay like in each village, I would kind of stay in with the same family for a month. And then, okay. yeah. And then I'd move to a different village. Okay. Your pictures are great. I mean, I, I do like documentary pictures. So they, that struck a chord with me also. Thank you. Uh, and Anya, can we bring up Anya's site, please, Munir? Everybody out there, watching knows that they have access to all these beautiful pictures also right you know you can go to the uh, fulbright website for the conference there's a link directly to this you yeah. can have some of these beautiful pieces in your own house if you'd like to go ahead sorry anya yeah note that a lot of them are for sale as well so and part of the proceeds do go to the fulbright association so you can buy you can purchase some of these so my work is, uh, I work a direct carving method, meaning I don't work from a model or I don't make a cut, I don't make something in another material first and then copy it in marble. I, I use the marble itself as inspiration. This piece you're looking at right now, it's a pink Portuguese marble. It had these beautiful veins. I'm like, this would just make a perfect torso. This is just <laughs> such a beautiful, the beautiful coloration and the and the stri not stripes but the lines within it. Um, it's actually a difficult marble. It's it's harder than the white Carrara marble. It has some bits of quartz in it, so it was difficult to work. But I, I really enjoyed how it came out. I do work figuratively, uh, as you can see, but not necessarily realistically. It's a sort of a abstraction of of um, of the figure and. And it's curious when you're when you're working in that town of Pietrasanta, you're you can't help but be influenced both by the past 
and the present and the current. So you see a lot of abstraction. So you, and then you see all of the, the old, the Renaissance work and, and, and you, you can't help but be influenced by that. So here's a piece I did that had two figures, I had two faces. I almost never put two faces in, but I just, the stone, this is what the stone wanted. I started doing a torso in it and it just wasn't working out. I'm like, you know what? I actually see a head in here. <laughs> so switched gears and, and started working. It's a beautiful piece of white Carrara marble. It's called Ordinario. If you look closely, you'll see these delicate gray stripes. And that's how you know it's the, what the Italians call ordinary, they're ordinary Carrara marble. Um, I think later on I have a piece in, the, oh, this is again a torso that, that just spoke to me by the shape the shape of the marble itself. I was like, wow, this is this is just perfect for a laying torso. Yeah, what, what kind of scale? Or, I mean, I, I can see because I've got the website up, but it's small on the screen. They're what pretty, scale are we looking at? How big are the yeah, pieces? How much do they are, weigh? How big are well, they? Well, they're small, but they weigh a lot. <laughs> the marble's pretty dense. This one's about 16 inches long and about eight inches high. Uh, but if you pick it up, I can pick that one up. It's maybe... 30, 40 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, of course, when I was in Italy, everybody was like, why are you working so small? You got to work bigger. <laughs> Again, this piece is small. Uh, you know, it's just this fragment of marble that was hanging out at the studio. I'm like, you know, there's, there's a head in there. I can see it. It's not that, it's a little bit over a foot tall and a foot wide. Um, and again, it's in the, it's in the ordinario, <clears throat> ordinario marble. This is again a piece in pink Portuguese, like the first torso that you saw. Uh, it had some beautiful striations. Uh, didn't necessarily bother me that the big splotch on the head was there. It just evoked a sort of peaceful kind of almost, almost like a Buddha-like feeling to me to have, uh, uh, to have this face in, in the stone. This is a little taller, it's about 19 inches. Here's another um, piece in white Carrara marble, a um, little bit bigger. This one's 17 inches by uh, by 12 by 12. Yeah, these are beautiful. You're fortunate to have worked there. Oh, thank you. you want to tell us about this one more piece here, and then we'll look at yeah. some dance video. Yeah, this one is actually the, one of the larger pieces that I have, and it probably weighs about 150 pounds, although it's only two feet high. Um, of course, I was influenced by, by seeing all the, the Greek sculptures around uh, and the copies in Italy and in, in Italian museums. And it's, it was a bit of a challenge to do the, um, to do the fabric. So that was, uh, that was this piece, yeah, draped woman. That is beautiful, just Thank beautiful you. finishes, just Thank beautiful you. work. Munir, can we pull up uh, some of the Aparna's couple dance videos here is that how you want to you want to look at it and you want to set them up for us Aparna what do you want to do yeah I can talk a little bit about um the piece before we show it so I've been working to modernize Perithmatium because I think the form is at this inflection point where it needs to adapt or it's going to die um you know 10-15 years ago in India I saw audiences leaving halfway through classical performances getting bored and these are like the top artists in the nation on mainstream stages. And it was just, you know, hip hop, salsa, um, aerobics <laughs> were more appealing to young audiences. And when you then take the dance form out of its native context and people don't even understand the lyrics and don't have a connection to the music, then it's even one more step removed. And so I've been really trying to foster more engagement with this art to change the framing of it. So it's not this exotic wow look at that and you just kind of stop there but people really try and understand the the layers that make up this form the footwork the the rhythm of the the ankle bells the hand gestures the um the use of the eyes and facial expressions um i'm also in terms of the expressive dance you know hindu mythology these are things that as a as an indian american they don't really motivate me i'm not religious i don't I know the myths, but they don't move me. And so I wanted, you know, I wanted to create work that moves me. And everybody understands rhythm. Everyone understands struggle and strife. And so one of the pieces that you'll pull up is 
is called Nymphesis, and it was created during the pandemic. Um, I wanted to use, you know, hand gestures to tell stories not in a way that is show and tell, but that is actually being. And so here you'll see kind of an isolation and use of the hands as a cocoon, as this creature entering into the world, um, and all of the fear that kind of comes along with this new thing being born, this creature coming into a scary world. Um, this is music that I developed for my dance. As I started changing and, and choreographing new work, I realized it doesn't fit the old classical music. And so this is a piece based on a chant that my father taught me. The lyrics uh, mean, lead me from ignorance to knowledge, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. Right. Do we have it? So that was just a little micro dance that I created for the North Carolina Dance Festival last year. Um, it was a pandemic year. We couldn't come together for, for a full piece. And so we did one minute micro dances created for the camera, um, you know, moving from kind of using the frame of the camera to, to kind of show these stages of a nymph being born of a praying mantis kind of. That's amazing. Coming. That's great. And you see it, you're amazing. That's just beautiful. Were you gonna see another one? Did you wanna? Sure. Did, um, a, did you want to do the one with the, the mask? Sure. Or do you want to yeah. do the other one on a side? Which did you want to look at? Either one. Um, you can see uh, let's do the let's do the resolute, the, the foot piece, maybe. Um, or this is fine too. So this is the the live version. This is the same piece, but choreographed for the stage. So you can kind of see some choreographic choices where um, you know there's there's not an ability to zoom in as an audience on the hands. And so uh, instead, you have to kind of um, step back and, and use the body to, to show that kind of emergence. So you can just kind of see, you know, the, the choreographing for different mediums. I think um, it, you, you have to make different choices. And now that there's so much um, online content and, and attention spans are so short, there are different choices. I think that it's important uh, for dancers to make. It's, it's always hard for dance to translate when, when it's not live. But um, yeah, well, it, it was are, fun. <laughs> they're great. Thank you so much. You don't look like you got that in you when you just look at you sitting there with that headphone on. <laughs> You're probably a blast at parties. This is my there. researcher room. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. 
<laughs> well, as other statisticians, you're probably a blast at parties. Uh, <laughs> Ava, tell us about your beautiful work. Munir, can we bring up Ava's work? And I, I have been struck seeing these at joining of fabric and textile with like knowing people that fire things, the, the incredible delicacy of these and the, you know, the beauty of the glaze you have on these. Yeah, I, um, there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, like lots of layers and, and meaning. And I, I don't really talk about my work so much. I sometimes write about it. If I write a proposal for a grant and I'm trying to make sense of my own work for myself, but I think what you can probably see here is my background with languages and linguistics. I think that that keeps coming back to me through the weaving. I see weaving and stitching as as language. It's, um, you know, the rhythm and uh, the composition. Even when I set up a, a warp, I I uh, the numbers, how many threads I set on the loom, or you know the rhythm I want to create. It is it is always somehow inspired by poetry or a reading or um, I don't know even even like a sentence. You know I would I would assign a color or a number to words and then I would repeat it. So I guess I I want symmetry. I like symmetry. I. Um, I'm not sure why I chose the square as a form and I find it really challenging to work with it. But when I try to walk away from it, it, it draws me back. And so I, I, I stuck with that. Um, but um, I, what else? I want to, oh yes, I have a little note here. I, I completely accidentally found clay. Um, I checked the questions quickly while um, others were talking and I saw somebody ask me about the Jolnay factory in Page. Yes, I did grow up in a country with a, uh, a rich tradition in ceramics, but at the time I was not in, I never wanted to work with clay. I always was a fibers person, but I took a, an elective um, when I was studying and um, I just went, when clay is wet and you roll it out, it's like a piece of cloth. At least that's what I saw in it. And I just instantly wanted to stitch into it. Of course, it's not as easy as it sounds because you have to, there, there are a lot of steps to figure out the holes and then the glazing. But what's interesting to me about my own work is that I want the symmetry and I plan it out. And there's a lot of symbolism in what I do. But then I just leave it up to chances completely. Um, so for example, this piece is that, that's on the screen right now, it was wood fired and I left the middle completely unglazed because I wanted the fire uh, to create something there. And the little dots are from another piece that was stacked on top of my hmm. piece that a lot of other, you know, ceramic artists wouldn't want, but I was happy to put something else on top and create a resist because, um, well, Adam already mentioned batik, but that's something I also practice. I, I dive with indigo a lot and I enjoy creating patterns and language with resisting the fabric with stitching or wax or other types of resist as well. So, um, once everything's fired, then I have to figure out the threads. And I love the juxtaposition between the, you know, the roughness on the hole, which you can see in the photo, but it's pretty rough inside. Sometimes it shreds the thread as I'm stitching uh, with, with silk or something really delicate that I naturally die because um, I want everything you know, to come from nature. So I I have undyed threads and then I dye them with all different um, plant materials. And that's how I try to bring it together, sort of like complementing the surface as opposed to embellishing it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. 
the, the little nodules there on some of them, those are tied, are those knots? Uh, in like the cross in this? Or like the one that was up, uh, the, the one where you were talking about pots, you've got a couple things in uh, that they're little, little dots in there. Yeah, the cross are those oh, tied yeah. knots? Yeah, those are French knots. So I, I use okay. traditional, um, I, I refer to back to traditional stitching. So um, what looks like language actually originates from a Sashiko pattern, a Japanese uh, embroidery pattern called Little Flower. And the knots are French knots, like a traditional embroidery stitch. Yes. Okay. Oh, they're beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, maybe open it up. Do we have folks out there that are, have been texting in or uh, to, that have questions for the panel in the last few minutes? We've got about, I think, 15 minutes outside. In yeah. Uh, so, Joe, in the Q&A there, um, I can read some here to get us started, but okay. the Q&A box at the bottom, um, all the panelists should be able to see that. Um, a question to all the panelists was, um, could you share like a memorable day or time during your Fulbright period um, of, you know, how just a, an example of a fun day doing art, I'm assuming, or maybe any story. So. This is for any panelist that wants to answer or all. It's very voluntary. People are thinking about which event they can talk about that won't be too scandalous and they didn't have really that much fun kind of hitting that balance. Yeah. It was serious yeah, research, wasn't I'm thinking it? Of you, yeah. The Fulbright year. <laughs> yeah, I think the uh, memorable experience for me was learning the process of um, creating a rawhide from water buffalo. Yeah. Um, I mean, just, you know, in a village um, so far away from home, so far away from anything that is familiar and, and then just being expected to jump right in and get your hands quite literally dirty. <laughs> and um, it's, it's amazing to, to have been able to do that. And I'm just so thankful only on a research grant like Fulbright would I've had the time to, to get into a project like that and start, I mean, not just from like, you know, making a work on the surface, but actually learning how to make the surface itself. Uh, so that's pretty memorable for me. Where, what stage did you come in? Had the buffalo been skinned? The buffalo was being skinned. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I didn't no, realize. I mean, it's I mean, like, no, no, but that's that's the thing. That's part of the point. I mean, you people in cities, and particularly if they're just they're, they're not a, in a big city with a big public market, they don't know what animals you look know. like. And what animals? No, that's do. true. And I but mean, yeah. the at the time, my language skills were so poor that I didn't realize what I'd be getting into. I really was just trying to find the hide in order and, right. and one large enough to do the, the room screen project because um, Wyong are usually about a foot tall. I mean, these are, these are small little pieces. So they said, okay, you want a piece that's a two meters by two and a half meters. Well, there's only one way to get it. <laughs> I, I feel bad about it, but, right. the, but the piece, um, yeah, piece exists. Who else I would has say one of the experience. One of the most fun was certainly traveling to the jungles in India and and uh, seeing tigers before they disappear from oh India, um, which was absolutely beautiful. One of the most uh, one of the funniest experiences was you know as an Indian American, every time I'd interview these gurus, I'd I'd be tested. Right, like mm. who are you as this American coming into my home? What are your questions? And so I had to prove myself, and I had to go through these hoops every time and sometimes it was um reciting chants and, and shlokas to them sometimes it was doing some of the basic steps so that they could you know assess my technique and often by the end of it they would be trying to set me up with their sons and you know, like I would ask these tests <laughs> we all laugh they'd be like asking my you know my bio data and it was just a it was a funny um transition but it was definitely a <laughs> earning their trust you were, you were doing your part to be a, a Fulbright ambassador. <laughs> That's right. I, I did what I had to do to, to get the survey filled out. <laughs> what else? Anybody else? Well, um, if I can add, I 
I have two memorable moments. One I already spoke about, which was visiting the quarries, the marble quarries up above Pietra Santa. But another is, it's actually my Fulbright story um, that's published on the website, the Fulbright Association website, which was the, the year that I was there. It's actually a few months after my year, but I was still in Italy. It was the 40th anniversary of the Fulbright program in Italy. And I was invited, invited to the celebration. So I actually got to meet Senator Fulbright. It's sh showing my age now, but uh, there he is at the banquet. And I got to just very briefly thank him at the end. I'm blowing my whole story because that was <laughs> that was the punchline. But I, I just ran up to him and said, just thank you so much for my Italian year. It was um, a thrill to be there. I bet thing. he heard that from more than one person too. I'm, you know, I'm sure it went in one ear and out thing. the other because there were quite yeah. a few. Oh people no, I, I'm sure that. I, I would guess that he appreciated it very much, but I bet oh. it's been said to him by multiple people. You know, yeah, he a, was very gracious. He was very gracious. Good thing, yeah. 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 It just shows that politicians can do good. Yep. They used to. <laughs> they can still do it. Yeah. Not giving up on humanity yet. No, you can't give up. No. Anybody else want to? Tell about a wild time doing shots with Senator Fulbright or anything. No, is that it? Are we done, Munir? We're, we've wrapped up a couple of minutes early. We have. I mean, you have nine more minutes uh, if you'd like to fill them. Um, is, I would. Does anyone uh, want to put work on a? work uh try out their stand-up act or anything is there anything <laughs> oh you know i sorry to hog up the time but i see a question from someone on the q a i just saw it um the question is has my artistry connected me to the international community in any unexpected way so unexpectedly actually um i, I wrote in my bio that um my parents were ukrainian immigrants so i grew up in in this um Ukrainian diaspora. I actually didn't know any non-Ukrainians till I went to high school, but I'm a totally American person. And after my Fulbright um, and the Soviet Union fell, I got an invitation from KU of Ukraine to be a participant in their international sculpture symposium. So I got to go to KU for a month and meet all these Ukrainian artists who are very curious about what's going on uh, in the United States and, and in Italy, they were, it was it was actually totally unexpected, but um, I really appreciated that in, invitation. And I got to speak in Ukrainian <laughs> and uh, sort of connected me to my my roots. Um, that Adam's That's great. Adam spoke about earlier having this connection. You know, you go there. I'd visited family there before, but once the Soviet Union fell, it was a totally different animal, much more enjoyable. And uh, I'm so glad to do it. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Yeah, Ava and I had talked a little bit about being in Budapest, and you see these old buildings there that were part of the Soviet bloc. These, and they painted them to make them look, you know, a little happier, but. They look pretty darn grim. How did, how did you, did, did you have to flee or did, were you out of there after the, uh, uh, you know, Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall stuff when the Soviet Union started falling apart? Did you exit before that happened? You're, you're muted, Ava. Uh, no, way, way after I moved here 2001. Oh, okay. um, when the so twin towers fell okay. yeah um that's right yeah you're, so, you're yeah no i i grew up there and um i but i traveled a lot i was i was lucky that i could travel a lot um when i was in high school which uh you know in the 80s i got a scholarship to spend two weeks in a in an american prep school in switzerland in lugano switzerland um, and I traveled because I was singing in a choir. I was I traveled quite a bit, so I didn't feel so locked in. But the little memory I wanted to share, I didn't realize I was muted, was that when I was 
younger, um, I loved the Beatles. And one of the reasons I wanted to learn English is because I wanted to understand what they were singing about. Right, we all loved, you know, the Beatles. And uh, when, I, when I was doing my Fulbright in, in Oregon teaching sophomore high school English, we had to do a segment on poetry. And I'm not a poet. You know, I went with the, I love language, but you know, it's, it's just challenging enough to teach English uh, to, as you pointed it out, show to uh, native speakers as a non-native speaker. And I was tested to my limits quite a bit. And uh, it was funny. You mean you, and you mean you encountered cruel high school students? Yeah, yeah. I um, don't believe that, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, so we did poetry and I collected homework and I went home and I sat down and I wanted to do, you know, my my good teaching job. And um, quite a few students submitted Beatles songs as their own poem because they had oh. this vision of me as a Hungarian coming from this country they couldn't place anywhere speaking English and I don't know what they were thinking about my background but but um that 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 was well in retrospect you know after so many years funny but challenging back then and yeah. Shel Silverstein which I was also familiar with you know and some of my favorite Shel Silverstein poems as their own so that was memorable they gave them to the wrong person yeah uh, and our do. last like two minutes or something thanks for sharing that uh Ava in our last couple of minutes Julia have you been back to Slovakia no, I actually haven't been to Slovakia since my Fulbright, um, but um, I very much want to return. Do you have connections there to get back? I mean, do you know the village leaders and whatnot? And well, yeah, and interestingly enough, um, I'll, several of the, the kids um, that I spent a lot of time with found me on Facebook, so you okay. can't hide anymore. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, it was it was an amazing it, experience. It, it seems tough to find market like for documentary things, like see or like funding for it. But I mean, if you know somebody that'll do a magazine article or you know media piece of some sort, it I, seems, I find it seems it, like a lot of things that we do as creatives, it's like for ourselves, and then you know it's hard to make any money off of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think. I think the experience is the most important thing and be, you know, having the chance to share it with, with other people. I mean, because I think we often like, I don't know, when someone looks a little different from ourselves, I think we often, you know, don't see, don't see the sameness. So um, I think sometimes uh, it's, you know, doing the project is more important than thinking about what, you know, how it's going to be commercially viable. Sure. I think something- No, but it's just like it, it's being able to do it. Like if, yeah. if somebody's independently wealthy, then that's not the question. They can do whatever they want to, but as far as sustainability goes, you know, to be able to do a serious invest, like what you did embedding yourself in, you know, for week after week after week, in a society, even though I'm sure the cost of living is real good, uh, it's still just being able to do it and basically stopping your career or your income. If you have an outlet for it, you're not stopping your career, you know, but. Well, grants are really important in, you know, and certainly the Fulbright things, you know, places yeah. like the Fulbright. The grants are fantastic, yeah. Yeah. And, and speaking of careers and money again, uh, for you folks out there listening, Maybe for the last time, unless Munir says it again, uh, the artwork up here is for sale and it'll benefit the, the artists themselves, uh, as well as the Fulbright Association. So have a look. Some of the stuff is affordable. Uh, at the very least, have a look just so you can enjoy seeing this great stuff. And, and, and I want to thank you guys so, so much for taking a couple hours out of your day and being so articulate and good humored. Your work is beautiful. I have such respect for you guys it's great thank you so much thank you joe thanks joe thank you joe thank you so much you're welcome